Hello everyone, welcome to the Tank Encyclopedia. I'm ya boy, Jim Zawaki, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Type 95 Hago tank, shall we? But first, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our patrons on Patreon. It is because of them that we can continue to help develop and expand, and because all the money they give, and potentially you could give as well, goes to helping us make new articles and features for you. And also, if you want to get in contact with us, we have a Discord, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that other stuff. And if you even want to talk to us in real time, we have a Discord server too. It's madness, it's chaos, but it's a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Now, on to the Hago. During the early 1930s, the continually growing Japanese military was in need of a new tank. This vehicle was to have good mobility, with sufficient firepower, and to be able to follow and support infantry and cavalry units. From these requests, a new vehicle, named Type 95 Ha-Go, would emerge. While it was only lightly armored and armed, its mobility and simplicity would play a great role in the Japanese expansion during the first years of the war. But by war's end, the Type 95 would become the most produced armored vehicle in Japanese inventory, or one of. It would also have the honor of being in service from the start to the end of the war. This article was written by Marco P. and Mark Nash. The Japanese Empire had no experience with tanks until 1918, when they imported a single Mark IV female tank from the UK. This was followed the following year by 13 French Renault FTs, the most common tank in the world at that time. In 1921, they purchased six British medium Mark A Whippet tanks, Later in the 1920s, they also produced the Renault NC-27, an updated version of the FT. In 1927, they produced a single Vickers Medium Mark C from the United Kingdom, along with a smaller number of Vickers 6-ton Mark E light tanks. The Mark C would form the catalyst of indigenous Japanese tank production, and was the last tank of the Mark E's that the Japanese purchased from a foreign source before the end of the Second World War. This is because General Suzuki of the Army argued that, from this point forward, tanks should be built in Japan so they could grow their tank building industry as well as their expertise. Japan's first tank grew from this argument and was designated the Type 89, Aigo or Chiro. Although built entirely in Japan, it was indeed quite derivative, almost a complete copy, of the Mark C but it was the first in a long line of many armored vehicles built by Japanese workers. The Quest for Mobility In 1933, at Kung Ling in Manchuria, Japan's first mechanized corps was formed as an independent mixed brigade. The corps was based on forces emerging in Europe intended to operate independently or alongside larger forces. The corps was based on tanks carrying mounted infantry tractor-drawn artillery, and engineering vehicles. The infantry was to be transported by a six-wheel trucks with an average speed of 60 kilometers an hour, while field artillery was to be towed by four-ton tractors with an average speed of 40 kilometers an hour. The speeds of these vehicles highlighted an issue with the Type 89 tank. At maximum, this tank could only travel at a modest speed of 25 kilometers an hour. This did not fit in with the idea a modern, mechanized corps, whose strategic role was to exploit speed and maneuverability to overthrow an enemy position. The Type 89 was designed first and foremost to support infantry, but this was a role it would find hard to fulfill if it could not keep up with troop transports and artillery tractors. The IJA High Command did not recognize the need for a new mobile tank. Slightly perturbed by this, the Army Technical Headquarters took on developing their own tank, independently of the High Command. Development History Elsewhere in the world, fast tanks were developed that could travel on wheels or tracks. A prime example of this was the Soviet BT-5. Based on American designer Walter Christie's design, the Japanese, however, did not go down this route. They were confident that they could produce a fast tank that was to remain fully tracked. They had already achieved this with a Type 92, Ju Sakosha, a vehicle which was classified as a heavy armored car in Japan. 
The Japanese military wanted to elaborate on this in the design of a highly mobile infantry support tank. As such, the military turned the Tomio Hara of the Army Technical Bureau. After gathering infantry and cavalry units' opinions, which set out the design requirements, Hara came up with a 7-ton design that had a top speed of 40 kilometers an hour. The opinion of the cavalry was at this time held above that of the infantry, and so it was promised to the cavalry that they would be the ones who used it most. The tank's general specifications were as follows. 4.38 meters long, 2.06 meters wide, 2.13 meters tall, and it was armed with 37 millimeter main gun and a fully rotating turret with a 6.5 millimeter machine gun in the bow. Armor was to be at least 12 millimeters thick in order to counter machine gun rounds, and the power plant consisted of the same 120 horsepower Mitsubishi six cylinder diesel engine as a Type 89. Hara had already designed a new suspension system, known as the bell crank suspension. It would have a three-man crew consisting of a driver, bow gunner, and a commander who also acted as the gunner. The initial design work on the new tank began in mid-1933 and was undertaken by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The next year, in August or in June depending on the source, the prototype was completed. The prototype was then put through a series of tests ranging from 700 kilometer endurance trials as well as gunnery tests. The tank was positively evaluated and praised as having excellent performance and sufficient durability. Initially, the prototype demonstrated a 43 km an hour top speed, as well as the ability to cross a 2 meter wide trench and be able to go 250 km without needing to refuel. These were all well received apart from the weight, which had crept up to 7.5 tons. After some alterations were made, it was again reduced back down to 6.5. The sources are not clear on how they removed this extra ton of weight, but suggested that the armor thickness was reduced. I'm sure that won't have any consequences. Additionally, the quantity of ammunition stored inside was also reduced, and there were likely some changes to the suspension design. Following these alterations, the tank was sent for retrial. An average top speed of 45 km an hour was attained. A 370 km operational trial was undertaken to confirm the endurance of the vehicle. In October 1934, the prototype was sent to the cavalry school for practical tests. The cavalry was extremely happy with the vehicle as a mobile and maneuverable light tank. They saw it as perfect for their needs. The infantry, however, wanted a tank that would provide support for them, and they were not happy saying that the 37mm was inadequate and that the armor was also inadequate. This disagreement between the branches resulted in a further period of testing between late 1934 and early 1935. The testing would be undertaken in northern Manchuria during the cold season, and it fell under the responsibility of an independent mixed brigade of infantry and cavalry stationed in the area. Their report suggested that the tank was ready for service, and the authors were pleased with its cold weather performance. The mixed brigade itself put forward a request to be equipped with the tank as soon as possible to replace the Type 92 armored car that they already had on order. Name. After the tank was received and accepted, it was designated the Type 95 Ha Go, as well as a name in Japanese, which I am not going to pronounce. The number 95 was given after the Japanese imperial year, otherwise known as Koki, 2595, 1935. Hago stands for third model, but it is also known as the Keigo, which can be translated as the third light vehicle. In some sources, it is also marked as the Kyugo. This article will refer to it as the Type 95. Entering service and further modification. With the success of the test trials and several requests from IGA units in the field, High Command finally recognized the tank's value, and they authorized the construction of a second prototype in June 1935, or 1934, depending on the source, which was completed by that November. One of the first things to change on the Type 95 was the crew compartment and the whole sides. The initial model had flat, vertical sides, thus making it very narrow internally. 
On the production model, the sides of the hull were rounded out, almost doubling the internal space and allowing the crew to operate the vehicle much more comfortably. This modification is what gave the Type 95 its unique hull shape. On the other hand, infantry units were still unhappy with the firepower of the Type 95, and for this reason, a secondary 6.5mm machine gun was added to the rear of the turret. With these modifications, the tank weighed an estimated 7.4 tons. Following the successful testing of the prototypes, a production order was placed. The production undertaken by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries began in 1936 at a slow pace, with only 31 vehicles being completed that year. A number of other companies and subcontractors were also involved in its production, including Niigata Teko Sho, Doa Jido Sho, Sagamu Arsenal, Ikekai Automobile Manufacturing Co., Ihesel Automobile, and etc. I'd also like to apologize to any of our Japanese viewers because I am not acquainted with your language. My apologies. The mass production of the Type 95 really started to kick off only around 1938. From 1938 to 1943, some 2,269 <laughs> would be built. These numbers differ depending on the source. As previously mentioned, production numbers, according to S.J. Zaloga, Japanese tanks 1939 1945, according to A. Ludek, Waffentechnik im Zweiten Weltkrieg, some 2,375 were built. According to P. Truhit, armored fighting vehicles, some 1,100 were built vehicles, while D. Nise, Naruzanje Drugog Svetstog Rada Japan gives slightly larger number of 1,161 tanks. The reason for these smaller production numbers are unclear. Authors P. Chamberman and C. Ellis, Light Tank Type 95 Q. Go, give a number of 1,300 vehicles being built. The precise year when the production of the Type 95 stopped is also unclear. Some sources mention that production continued up to the war's end in 1945. The Type 95 light tank had a standard hull configuration, with a front-mounted transmission, a crew compartment in the center, and an engine in the rear, separated from the crew space by a firewall. While the lower hull had a simple box-shaped design, the superstructure was built using angled and curved armored plates. The Type 95 was both riveted and welded in construction. Plates were riveted to an internal iron frame with welds securing curved areas. This tank was one of the first Japanese tanks to utilize welding in its construction. Turret. The Type 95 had a rather small one-man turret, with the main gun placed at the front and an additional main placed at an unusual angle facing the 5 o'clock position to the rear right. The turret was constructed using a combination of welds and rivets. The Type 95 had a command cupola with several vision slits protected with armored glass, and a two-piece hatch on top. There was also a small observation hatch placed to the rear. In addition, on the front left turret side, a small pistol port could be seen. Engine. The Type 95 was propelled by a 120 horsepower Mitsubishi six-cylinder diesel engine with a weight of 7.4 tons. The Type 95 could reach a top speed of 40 to 45 kilometers an hour or maybe even up to 48 kilometers an hour, depending on the source. The fuel load consisted of 84 liters in the primary tank, plus an additional 22 liters in auxiliary reserve tanks, or 104 plus 27, again depending on the source. The operational range was between 200 and 250 kilometers. You guessed it, depending on the source. The Japanese decision to use diesel engines in their tanks reportedly goes back to when the army was testing the British Mark E. During a trial, one of these petrol engine tanks burst into flames, killing the entire crew. Oh no. The Type 95 engine was installed in the rear of the vehicle, slightly off to the right. Its exhaust protruded from the engine's bay right, bent at a right angle, while the transmission was located at the front of the vehicle, along with the drive wheels. This meant that a prop shaft extended throughout the crew compartment, protected by a simple hood. The commander would have to step over and try not to trip on it as he traversed the turret. The Type 95 used a sliding gear transmission with four forward and one rear speed. 
the transmission was enclosed internally by a panel of asbestos. Yeah, asbestos. That's a great idea to put that inside of a vehicle. On the outside of the vehicle, there were two separate hatches on the upper glacis that granted access to the brakes and the final drives. Suspension and running gear. The Type 95 utilized a bell crank suspension, one of Tomi O'Hara's own designs. The bell crank suspension consisted of bogies mounted on arms, which are connected to a long helical compression spring placed horizontally on the sides of the hull. The spring is protected by a long segment of piping riveted to the hull side. The bogies push against each other via this spring when passing over terrain, allowing the bogies to actuate. The Type 95 had four road wheels, with two large wheels per bogey. There were advantages to the bell crank system. It was easy to produce and maintain. It was also mounted completely externally, meaning no internal space was taken up by the system, unlike torsion bars or the Christie system. However, there were also downsides. The bogies had so much room to move that pitching was rather severe on the Type 95 producing an extremely rough ride over rough terrain. If the, if the tank went over too deep a hole, there was even a good chance they would get stuck. There were two return rollers, one above each bogey, and idler wheel at the rear. The idler was held in place by a single unprotected bracket. While this allowed the crew to tighten the track tension easily, it also made it vulnerable to enemy fire. One report shows an Australian soldier managing to mobilize a Type 95 by hitting the idler with his own rifle bullet. The all-metal tracks were narrow, at just 25 centimeters across, and there were around 98 lengths per total per side. Despite being designed to provide a good off-road drive, it was soon discovered that the Hago suspension system was far from perfect. Troops in Manchuria were the first to be equipped with the Hago, and the first to find issues with the suspension's pitching problems. The Manchurian environment caused a unique problem to arise. It was found that, when crossing the Kaoliang fields, a staple crop in Manchuria, the sequence of furrows exactly matched that of the layout of the bogey wheels, resulting in severe pitching. This was fixed by the addition of small support rollers between the two larger wheels of the bogies. Because of where this modification was done, it became known as the Manchu suspension. The feature was not required on the Type 95s stationed in other theaters. The Type 95 was only lightly protected, with armor thickness ranging from between 6 and 12 millimeters. On the lower hull, the upper glacis armor plate was just 9 millimeters at a 72 degree angle, and the lower front was 12 millimeters at an 18 degree angle. The front superstructure's face hardened armor was 12 millimeters thick, while the sides were also 12 placed at a 34 degree angle. The rear engine compartment was protected by 6 to 12 millimeters of armor at 26 degrees. The roof and floor were protected by 9 millimeters and the turret had 12 millimeters all around. The front armor was placed at 90 degrees, the side at 11, and 90 degrees again angled to the rear. The roof of the turret was 9 millimeters thick as was the hull. To increase protection by screening the tank from enemy fire, some Type 95 were provided with turret-mounted smoke dischargers in rows of four. An innovative feature of the Type 95 was that the internal surfaces were covered in layers of asbestos. Yeah, that's totally a good idea. This served two purposes. As the tank would be operating in hot climates, asbestos's insulating properties meant that it would help keep the tank and crew inside cool. Secondly, it had the added bonus of providing some padding to the internal surfaces, giving the crew a little bit more comfort over rough terrain. The health issues caused by asbestos were not well known back then, but it does cause severe issues for people exposed to asbestos dust. So stay away from it. The main armament of the vehicle was a 37mm Type 94 L-36.7 gun. With a muzzle velocity of 545 millimeters a second, it could penetrate 35 millimeters armor at 300 meters with armor piercing rounds. The gun could also fire HE rounds, although the effect of the 37 millimeter HE was rather insignificant. 
a semi-automatic slide and breech lock fed ammunition. Loading the gun would have been extremely easy to do one-handed as the cartridges were rather small, at around 13 centimeters long and 4 centimeters in diameter. The ammunition load consisted of some 119 rounds, or 75 to 130 depending on the source. It also appears that there was no general rule on how many shells were AP or HE in the ratio. This gun was actually a slightly modified version of the same names 37mm infantry anti-tank gun. For tank use, the gun was installed on a heavy-duty, non-geared mount. It was aimed manually by the commander, who would hold the weapon like a giant rifle with his right hand on the grip and the trigger, and with his right shoulder braced against the shoulder brace or lock. I don't know how to I don't know how to gesture this. Thanks to this, the gun can be somewhat stabilized and fired on the move, although not very accurately. The mount also allowed around 10 degrees of horizontal traverse left and right independently of the turret, a feature carried over from the very early French tanks that Japan had purchased. The turret was manually rotated by a hand crank to the right of the gun. The elevation range, yeah, this is what it looks like turning the turret, probably. That crank, like. Yeah. The elevation range of this gun was minus 15 to plus 25 degrees. Small numbers of Type 95s are claimed to have been equipped with additional 37mm Type 94s placed instead of the whole position machine gun. The elevation of this gun was limited at only 10 degrees up. Later produced models were rearmed with a slightly improved 37mm Type 97 and some sources marked as a Type 98 a gun with a muzzle velocity of 675 meters a second. While some vehicles were alleged to have been equipped with the 47mm guns, no photographic evidence of this has come up. But if you have pictures of it, send them to us, and we'll verify, and then we'll put that in the article if that's the way it is. The secondary armament consisted of one machine gun placed in the hull's left side, with an additional machine gun was placed in the rear of the turret. Both machine guns were placed in ball-like mounts, with a vertical and horizontal axis of traverse. Initially, the Type 95 was equipped with a Type 91 6.5mm machine gun. This was simply a modified version of the Type 11 machine gun, an infantry weapon that was air-cooled and fed via a side-mounted hopper. The Type 91 did away with the stock of the Type 11 and replaced it with an angled pistol grip so that it was more maneuverable inside the tank. This machine gun was replaced by the Type 97 7.7mm heavy tank machine gun later during the production. Again, this was an air-cooled gun, but it was fed from a top-loading mechanism, similar to the British Bren gun. The machine gun was actually a Japanese version of the Czech ZB VZ-26 machine gun. It was equipped with a stock which was angled off to the right allowing the gunner to line up his eye with the sight. Both machine guns were mounted to the tank with a 1.5 telescopic sight which had a 30 degree field of view. The Type 97 was primarily a tank based weapon, as its weight restricted its use by infantry. The whole position machine gun had a traverse of 30 degrees. The turret position machine gun was actually placed at a 120 degree angle over the right shoulder of the commander with respect to the main gun. This machine gun had a traverse of 25 millimeters. It was installed there so that when the tank was in infantry support role, the commander could traverse the turret around and just use the machine gun without the 37 millimeter. This unusual configuration had a negative side, however, as it prevented the Type 95 crew from using both weapons at a single target. This was somewhat compensated by the possibility of installing one of the two machine guns, usually the turret machine gun, on a mount in the turret top, facing forward. Both machine guns were also fitted with a removable armored cover that protected the external part of the barrel from shrapnel damage. Ammunition load of the machine gun was between 2,940 and 3,300 rounds, of course, depending on the source. The crew. 
The Type 95 was crewed by three dudes, consisting of the driver, hull gunner, and commander, who was also the gunner. Interestingly, a number of sources mentioned that the Type 95 had a crew of four, which is incorrect. If you see someone telling you that this tank had four people, they're wrong. And be sure to tell them, we can't let this kind of information exist. Everyone in the world has to know that this tank only had three people in it at once. So if you see anyone who tells you that this had four people, they're wrong, and you have to tell them that. Anyways, the driver was located at the front right of the tank. He operated the vehicle in the traditional method, using two tillers. The driver's hatch was rounded and hood-like. It was located to his front, and was hinged at the top and opened out. The driver could see out of the hatch in three ways for maximum protection. The hatch could be closed, but there was a simple, narrow slit cut into it for limited vision. Unusually for the time, the vision slits were protected by reinforced glass that was placed in rubber mountings on the inside of the hatch. For a slightly better vision, but still protected, there was a smaller, square hatch in the center of the hood. In non-combat areas, the hood could, of course, be fully open when driving. Besides the standard driving controls, the driver was also provided with two small dashboards. The first dashboard was in front of him and contained a number of instruments, like a speedometer, starter button, and a tachometer, or touchometer. I don't know how to pronounce that word. The secondary dashboard was placed to his right. It contained an oil pressure gauge, ammeter, generator, and headlight switches. On the driver's left was the machine gun operator. His position was three-sided, with the machine gun mounted at the flat front. He had no hatch, and would have had to enter and exit the vehicle through the turret. He did have two small vision ports, though, one to his left and one to his right, cut into the angled areas of the semi-hexagonal structure. The commander was located in the one-man conical turret, which was mounted slightly off to the left of the center line. He was the most overworked of the crew, as he was in charge of commanding and directing the tank, as well as the other crew members. On top of this, he had to act as the loader and gunner of the 37mm gun and the rear position machine gun. He also had to turn the turret. For this, he was provided with a lever on his left side. The commander had no internal radio to speak to the crew, and said he had a speaking tube that led to the driver and the bow gunner. Unless it was a command vehicle, the Type 95, or Japanese tanks in general, rarely carried a radio capable of outside broadcast. For the most part, commanders would have to rely on signal flags to communicate with other vehicles. However, the radio-equipped vehicles could easily be distinguished by the turret top mount, round shape antennas. A feature which highlights the original infantry support role of the Type 95 was the infantry buzzer on the back of the vehicle. This is an often overlooked feature of the Type 95. It consisted of a fake bolt head. Infantry outside the tank could use it to get the attention of the tank commander. The Type 95 was one of the first ever tanks to have such a feature. In Combat First Experience in China, 1937 During the mid-1930s, the Imperial Japanese Army formed the so-called Mixed Mechanized Brigade. This unit consisted of a mechanized infantry brigade and was reinforced with a platoon of Type 95 light tanks in 1935. The same year, this unit was sent to the Great Kinjan Mountains for the detailed and rigorous bad weather testing. The mixed mechanized brigade was then combat tested during the Japanese invasion of Shaanxi province in China. While the mechanized infantry elements of this unit did see some action, the light tank regiment was unable to see any major action. Inadequate performance of this unit would eventually lead to the disbandment of the mixed mechanized brigade concept. After this, the tank units would be mainly used as support elements of infantry divisions. While the war in China lasted up to 1945, the use of Type 95 in this theater is not clear in the sources. It appears that, while a number of them were stationed in Manchuria and northern China, most were used on the Pacific Front until the end of the war. The Battle of Kalkin Gol. The first time the Type 95 faced enemy armor was during the Battle of Kalkin Gol, or the Nomenhan Incident.
as it was known by the Japanese, in 1939. The Japanese armored force consisted of the first tank group, commanded by General Masaoma Yosuka, reinforced with the 3rd and 4th tank regiments, an armored strength consisting of 73 tanks and 14 tankettes. The 4th tank regiment, which was under the command of Colonel Yoshio Tamada, had 35 Type 95 tanks with 8 Type 89 and 3 Type 94 tankettes. These were supplemented by an additional 50 armored cars and tankettes distributed amongst the infantry and cavalry units. The Soviet armored strength, on the other hand, consisted of 550 tanks, mostly of the BT series, and 450 armored cars. The odds are very much not stacked in the Japanese favor. The Japanese forces, which consisted of the 3rd Tank Regiment, or 41 tanks, and the 7th Infantry Division, attacked the positions of the Soviet 914th Motor Rifle Regiment and the 9th Mechanized Brigade on the 2nd of July, 1939. With the support of the armored element, the Japanese managed to break through the Soviet defensive line. But in the following days, the Soviets counterattacked, which led to very heavy Japanese tank losses. At the end of the battle, some 42 out of the 73 tanks were reported to be lost, while around 13 could be recovered and repaired. The Japanese tankers managed to destroy some 32 Soviet tanks, as well as an additional 35 Soviet armored cars so they claim. The Type 95 performed well and, with its 37mm gun, could effectively destroy any Soviet armored vehicle due to their weak armor. The Type 95's armor, however, was an easy target for Soviet gunners, who generally outperformed their Japanese counterparts with their 45mm guns. The loss of the battle at Kalkangol and the signing of the molotov ribbentrop Pact forced the Japanese to turn their attention to the Pacific and Southeast Asia, under the doctrine of Nanshin-ron. Prior to 1941, the Japanese initiated a number of new projects with the aim of increasing the number of armored vehicles, improving the general performance, and changing the overall organization of these formations. While some goals would be achieved to some extent, like increasing the numbers of tanks or developing better guns, a major expansion in the armored vehicle distribution and development of advanced tanks was not possible due to the limited industrial capabilities and the priority given to other military branches, like the Navy and the Air Force. Inter-service rivalry was a very big problem in the Japanese military and would plague them many times throughout the war. Nevertheless, the Japanese Army managed to form a number of new tank regiments and to reinforce at least 10 infantry divisions with their own organic tank companies, consisting of 9 Type 95 tanks. In total, by the start of the Pacific War, the Japanese had around 2,200 tanks, with the majority of those being the Hago. War with the Allies Following Japanese military actions in Asia, and especially during the occupation of French Indochina, the U.S. government, in partnership with Canada and Great Britain, introduced economic sanctions against Japan. Of these, oil sanctions hit Japan particularly hard, as it was heavily dependent on imported oil. It was this action, along with other pressures, which would eventually lead to an open war with Japan.